Do you remember this, the first ever image of a black hole? Well, it just got an upgrade, but not in the way that you might think. Because no new data has been taken with the Event Horizon Telescope to actually produce this image. Instead, a new research paper by Medeiros and collaborators has reprocessed the data with a new computer algorithm to produce this higher resolution image. It's pretty much the scientific equivalent of saying, can you enhance that? Can you enhance it? Can we enhance this? Can you enhance it? Hold on a second, I'll enhance. So to understand how this algorithm has managed to be able to get such a sharper image compared to the one that was first produced back in 2019, there's a few things we're gonna have to go through. First of all, what data the Event Horizon Telescope actually collects. Second, why an algorithm is even needed to make the image from the data. And three, how this new algorithm differs from the old one back in 2019. Then we'll chat about the exciting astrophysics related stuff that we can learn from this new image. But to kick us off, let's start with explaining what the Event Horizon Telescope is actually up to. So the goal for the Event Horizon Telescope was always to image a black hole. Now obviously black holes themselves don't give out light, that's the whole definition of a black hole, but the regions around a black hole are incredibly turbulent, they get heated up to extreme temperatures because of the extreme speeds they're going at, because of the extreme gravity, and that material does actually glow so that we can see it, and the black hole itself casts a shadow on that material. Now the biggest, closest black holes to us that we had the best chance of actually being able to take an image of were either the one in the centre of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, or the one in the centre of the galaxy Messier 87, which is 1,600 times heavier than the black hole in the centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way, which also means that it's 1,600 times wider as well because the mass and the size of a black hole, the size of the event horizon, that point of no return, are correlated, but Messier 87 is also 2,000 times further away from us than the black hole at the centre of the Milky Way, which means that they appear roughly the same size to us on the sky just because of our perspective, their sizes at various different distances. That size is about 20 micro arc seconds across. To put that number into context, if you take the night sky and you split it into 360 degrees all the way around in a circle, the moon is half a degree across. You're already having to split your base unit for one of the biggest things in the night sky. So what we do is we take one degree and we split it into 60. In the same way that there's 60 minutes in an hour, we call a 60th of a degree an arc minute. So the moon at half a degree is about 30 arc minutes across. You can take an arc minute and split it again into 60. And we call this an arc second, like there are 60 seconds in a minute. And so Mars, for example, one of our nearest planets, roughly when it's closest to us is around about 25 arc seconds across. Compare that to one of the brightest stars in the night sky, Sirius, near the constellation of Orion, which is only 6 milli arc seconds across, so 0 0.006 arc seconds. But the black hole at the centre of Messier 87 is 200 times smaller than that even at 20 milli arc seconds across, or 0 0.00002 arc seconds, if you want to put that back into degrees, it's 0 0.000005 degrees. It's absolutely tiny. And to make out something that small on the sky, to actually be able to resolve it into its actual shape and not just see a fuzzy blob that looks a little bit like a fuzzy star, you actually need a really big telescope. And there's actually an equation that you can use to calculate how big of a telescope you would need. So that equation is theta equals 1.22 lambda over d, where theta is the angular size. So what we just talked about, about right? we were talking about the angular size of things in the sky. We measure the size of things in the sky in terms of the fraction of 360 degrees all the way around, because it is like the inside of a sphere, so you don't really use actual distances, you use angular size. Lambda here is the wavelength of light that you're observing in. So what's the wavelength length of your telescope, for example. And then D is the diameter of the telescope that you need. 
So if you wanted to observe the black hole at the center of Messier 87 with visible light that we see with our eyes or what the likes of the Hubble Space Telescope uses at around about 550 nanometers wavelength, then you can plug these numbers in, knowing that your angular diameter has to be in radians, annoyingly, not degrees, and you find that you would need a seven kilometer wide telescope to resolve it. Now, optical telescopes, infrared telescopes, all work by having a mirror that collects light and focuses it down to a detector. And it's not feasible to build a mirror that is essentially the size of a city in terms of the diameter that it is across. What we can do, however, instead of building one giant telescope is have two smaller telescopes that we can actually combine the light from together to give us a telescope that is effectively the size of the distance between the two telescopes. Now this is really actually quite difficult to do with visible light that we see with our eyes. There's a lot of issues with the fact that, you know, visible light coming through the atmosphere is massively more effective than radio light is by like turbulence in the atmosphere. So you're having two different paths through that turbulence to each of the different telescopes. We've managed to actually do this out to a kilometer with visible light, but nothing near seven kilometers. However, it is much easier to do with longer wavelengths of light, like radio waves. However, if you go back to our equation of how big of a telescope you need to do this, and you plug in a number for the wavelength of radio light, let's say around a millimeter, then you find the radio telescope you need to do this is around 12,600 kilometers across. Which is just less than the diameter of the entire Earth. It sounds impossible, but it's not. That's exactly what the Event Horizon Telescope set out to do. An international effort to combine individual radio telescopes from across the world that individually would have just seen a little fuzz blob in the sky when they looked towards the center of Messier 87, but together could create a telescope that was effectively the diameter of the Earth. And so with them all observing at the same time, they each fill in a tiny piece of the picture. And if you wait for the Earth to rotate and observe for long enough, each telescope fills in a larger and larger section of that picture. Which is great, but the problem is your telescopes are at fixed locations. And unless you start building a whole lot more, which is very expensive than using already existing radio telescopes to create this big array, then you're not gonna fill in any more of those gaps any time soon. Which is why the Event Horizon Telescope needs an algorithm to create the image from the limited data that it is able to collect. Where there are those pixels in the image where you've got no data for them, where there are gaps, you train a computer in a process what's known as machine learning to fill in what those pixels most likely look like. Now, this is a lot easier if you know what the object that you're looking at actually looks like. So for example, if you've taken a half complete image of the daytime sky, you know that it's mostly going to be blue with some patches of clouds around. So the pixels are either going to be white or blue. And for any missing pixels, it's a pretty good guess to say, well, the pixels nearest to it that do have data, they're going to inform me whether this pixel is more likely to be blue or white, either sky or cloud. When you don't know what something looks like, so when the object that you're looking at, you know, you don't know the shape of the object or the brightness of the object or any of the structural properties of the object, then you have to be really, really careful with this, that you don't assume something is there when you don't have the data to support it. So if you look at one of the original Event Horizon Telescope papers released back in 2019, there was a lot released all at once, this one is paper four, you can see that the collaboration split into four independent teams to do this. They couldn't talk to each other at all. They were completely independent so that they didn't influence each other's findings. And they could only compare results right at the very end. And this was one of the Event Horizon Telescope's collaborations way of ensuring that whatever image they got out at the end was actually reliable. Because if all four teams have found something completely different, then you knew the algorithms weren't giving you anything that was reasonable at all. But what you can see is that all four teams found something very similar with the main features of this black hole image of a ring shape and some bright hotspots all common across each of the four images. 
I'm just showing you the algorithm run on data from one night here as well. The Event Horizon Telescope collaboration actually took data over four separate nights. So that eventual image that was released, sort of was like as a press release, was essentially an average of those four nights and also all of the different algorithms used by the four different teams. Now I realized that was quite a quick overview on how the Event Horizon Telescope and the algorithm to produce the image actually work. If you want a deeper dive, then I've made videos on this channel before on both the images of the black holes in the center of Messier 87 and also in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which I'll link below. Plus there's some fantastic videos and talks from the Event Horizon team here on YouTube explaining how they did it. Plus of course, videos from brilliant scientific communicators on this platform. And again, I'll link a few of those below. But here in this video, I wanna focus on this new image and the differences between it and the old one. And so this final question of how this new algorithm is different from the ones first used in 2019. So previously back in 2019, the algorithms used were what's known as model independent. What that means is that they didn't assume that they knew anything about what the final image should look like. They didn't assume a shape for what the black hole was or any properties. They just said, we don't know anything about it. And they trained that algorithm on pretty much every single digital image that's ever been uploaded to the internet. So think all the selfies that you've ever put up, landscape images, even like space images from other telescopes, like from Hubble, for example, and everything in between. Now, despite this, despite giving the algorithm no information whatsoever, all four teams found that the black hole image had this structure, this ring of light that had been predicted by simulations using our best theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of general relativity, for what we should see when we look at a black hole. We should see the light given off by this hot material swirling around the black hole in this big flat disc bent around the black hole so that we see this ring from almost any angle that we look at it from. Now you'd think that despite how often we have tested general relativity over and over and over again on so many different scales and you know constantly found that Einstein was right with his theory of gravity, that we could have assumed that that was the case and that we were gonna get an image like that, but we didn't want to do that. The collaboration were very concerned about getting a completely unbiased image with no assumptions going into it at all. Because if you do have missing data, you don't wanna make assumptions about what that data looks like. And once again, infer that something is there when it isn't. Especially because one of the goals of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration was to get the image and then use it to test the predictions of general relativity of you know what size of a ring you get and what different properties that you get as well. Now, of course they did once again, find that the predictions made by general relativity fit their data excellently, which was great, but also a little bit frustrating because there's been a lot of people worldwide working on alternate theories of gravity because on some scales, general relativity lets us down a little bit. It's why we have to invoke the existence of dark matter. This is one of the reasons, there's many other reasons as well, but we still wanna test all the time whether general relativity still is our best theory of gravity. And I've made other videos on this before, what's known as modified gravity. Again, if you wanna check that out, I'll link it in the video description down below. Now, as of 2022, it's not just Messier 87 supermassive black hole that we have an image for. We also have an image for the Milky Way's supermassive black hole at the center known as Sagittarius A star. And there's a joke amongst us astronomers that you know stems historically from the fact that data was pretty scarce for us in the past. And that joke is that two data points makes a line, right? Two data points is a trend. Now we know it's a joke, I know it's a joke, but I think it's quite a fun segue into what Medeiros and collaborators have actually done this month. They've essentially said that given that the separate Event Horizon Telescope teams all found that ring structure on two separate objects, 
and once again found that general relativity gives us a very good prediction for what we should find, then they've said, okay, we can assume that general relativity is correct. And instead of a model independent algorithm, we can now use an algorithm that is trained on a, on a huge suite of general relativistic simulated black hole images, all seen from different angles at different masses, spins, and with different densities of glowing material around the black hole. Again, this is what the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration Team originally wanted to avoid because they wanted to avoid biasing the image they got out. But under the assumption that we've got this unbiased image out twice now on lots of different occasions with different data that's taken on different nights, it suggests that that is truly the structure of the object that we're looking at. So if we go back to our analogy before of taking an image of the daytime sky, it's like we now know we're definitely looking at an image with the sky and clouds in it. So we know there's also going to be edges between the sky and the clouds. And so those edges are going to be a lot crisper and clearer. So similarly, Medeiros and collaborators said, we now know we are definitely looking at a black hole and this is what black holes look like. So we can take the exact same raw data that the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration team used back in 2019, run it through our diff for an algorithm and lo and behold, they get out a much crisper and clearer image. So much so they actually had to degrade it slightly back to that resolution limit for the Event Horizon Telescope that we calculated before with theta equals 1.22 lambda over D. They then find that that ring is 41.5 plus or minus 0.6 micro arc seconds across and at least two times thinner than what was found in the 2019 image. Why do we care about these numbers? Well, these are properties of the ring that directly correlate with the supermassive black hole's mass. So with a much clearer and crisper image where you can get a much more precise measurement of the diameter and the thickness of that ring, you can get a much more precise and accurate measurement of the supermassive black hole's mass. Plus also it more accurately and precisely traces where the gas actually is and how it's moving as well. And so therefore you can do even more tests of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now, sadly, these calculations and this analysis hasn't yet been published in Medeiros and Collaborators' paper that was released this month. That's going to be the next step in this research project. And I'm really excited for when all that analysis is done. So you know that once it's published, I'm going to be chatting about it right here on this channel. So make sure you're subscribed and you've got the bell on so you don't miss any science in the future. If you liked this video, you might also like my book, A Brief History of Black Holes, which explains all of the common misconceptions around black holes by going through the history of our understanding. There is a link in the video description down below to the hardback, the audio and ebook versions if you fancy grabbing a copy. All right, enough from me. Give the people what they want and roll those bloopers already half a degree across. You're already splitting your basic unit. So astronomers have a fly that keeps flying around in front of the camera. That stems from the fact that, you know, historically data was very scarce for us. Scarce? Scarce. Scarce. It's like scarf. Scarce. I just decided it was pronounced completely different. <laughs> now this is what the Event Horizon Telescope Club are them. Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration Team. I've just said it too many times now that it's just, I'm trying to say it so fast, it's all just becoming one little blob of a thing that can't get out. And of course, you've got videos explaining this from brilliant scientific communicators on this. Communicators? <laughs> it's like a wicked reference, especially great communicators. Did they have brains and knowledge? Yes. Yes, they did.